Howdy. Today we move away from strict discussions of the comics form and back to thinking about the history of comics. Now, it's worth noting that this class is really going to focus on the history and tradition of American comics. There are a lot of other really great classes on campus if you want to learn more about manga, bandesines, or other traditions of the comics form. Which brings us to newspapers. Because the comic as we know it is born in the papers. So we're actually going to start a little bit before newspapers, back in 1440 when Johannes Gutenberg invents the printing press and with it, movable type printing. As I mentioned in the prehistory of comics lecture, this was responsible for a huge change in culture and society. There's a massive rise in literacy, print reproductions of books and images are now available to a growing middle class, and it's the beginning of what we call print culture. Print culture is really where the newspapers are born. Newspapers begin to be printed in earnest in the 17th century, the 1600s. Another form of publication that becomes very popular around this time is the broadsheet. It's a large format newspaper, or almost a poster, which usually featured images on one side and text on the back. These were often tabloid-like in nature, and frequently very politically inflammatory as opposed to the newspapers, which tended to be a little bit more serious. It's in the newspapers and these broadsheets that we really get the birth of political cartoons. These gain a lot of popularity in the 18th century and are really secured in their importance and popularity around the time of the French Revolution. Here is an example of a broadsheet up close. Again, we talked about this piece in a little more detail in our prehistory of comics. Many of these broadsheets featured comics like panels, word balloons, captions. And here are some examples of some early political cartooning. Seems that certain things about political cartooning remain the same. We like to make fun of people's sizes, of what they eat, of how silly they look when they're wearing certain clothes. These particular political cartoons are English, but as I mentioned previously, there was also a very robust tradition of political cartooning in France. Now you might remember Rudolf Topfer, our grandfather of comics, whose satirical stories were published in books, but became deeply influential on the first generation of newspaper cartoonists. Now just to scratch your memory, here are a few images of Topfer's books. We've lost the word balloons, but captions are very important. We have clear panels. And more than that, we have this simplified art style that is really beginning to take place and influence cartoonists of the future generations. Caricature and exaggeration become a big part of this tradition. Around the mid to late 19th century, we begin to get satire and comedy magazines. And it's in one of these, Punch, that we first hear the term cartoon. We also get what many call the first cartoon character, and that's Ali Sloper from Ali Sloper's Half Holiday. He was not just a one-off character, but would recur monthly or weekly, as the paper was published. It was printed regularly from 1884 to 1923, with only a few interruptions, most of them during the First World War. And that's why it's generally called the first comic strip. Punch and Ali Sloper's Half Holiday were part of a really interesting and exciting tradition of humor magazines, satire magazines, the sort of grandfathers of Mad Magazine, which you might know. Here are some examples, again, from England, illustrated chips, comics cuts, you can see how he started as a mixture of text and images, but the images, the political cartoons, became the most popular part. And so slowly but surely, they became mostly comics. In 1895, a cartoonist named Richard Olcott publishes the first Hogan's Alley strip, Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper, The New York World. This is a turning point in American comics history. Hogan's Alley was a huge hit. It was eventually published several times a week, and even after that, given a full-page strip in color on Sundays. What was Hogan's Alley? Well, it featured the hijinks of children from the wrong side of town, and particularly featured a character called the Yellow Kid. Here's that first Hogan's Alley strip. You can see we've got a bunch of kids doing a circus in this case, and the joke is ultimately that you know, these poor kids try to put on a circus and it doesn't quite come off. There are goats and dogs and they're falling all over the place and using tin cans. Maybe not to our tastes, but it was really a huge hit. 
And in the bottom right corner, you see a little kid with a shaved head in a long nightshirt. This would be the yellow kid. He eventually becomes the star of the show. He's sort of like Steve Urkel in Family Matters. He was just a side character who became the most popular character of the strip. And we understand his head is probably shaved because of lice. That was the most common reason children had their heads shaved in poor neighborhoods. And his oversized nightshirt just shows that you know, he doesn't have much more in the sense of clothing. Slowly but surely, the yellow kid, who doesn't actually talk, would begin to write slogans on his shirt. And those slogans would be the punchline or joke of the story. Now, the yellow kid is super popular. He begins to be put on everything. He's really the first massive merchandising hit. He's on, as you can see, chewing gum, cigarettes, soap. You can get dolls and toys. He is a national phenomenon. And that makes Richard Olcott a national phenomenon as well. And it also manages to sell a lot of papers for Pulitzer. In 1895, William Randolph Hearst acquires the New York Journal. And the following year, he hires Olcott away from Pulitzer's newspaper at a much higher wage. However, Olcott was unable to obtain the copyright for The Yellow Kid. In fact, a lot of our early cases about copyright law center around The Yellow Kid, merchandising and copywriting the character. So for a period of time in New York, both the New York World and the New York Journal published Yellow Kid strips. Pulitzer's paper arguing that this is where Yellow Kid's natural home was, this is where he was born. New York World, Hearst's paper arguing, well, we have Occult, the actual artist. Ours is the real Yellow Kid. And as you can see from this political cartoon I've included, this is actually where we get the term yellow journalism, because the circulation wars between Pulitzer and Hearst, which were very intense and included things like lurid headlines and paying attention to things that might shock people, was only part of what was fueling the war between these two newspapers. The other thing was their comic strips. Now, following Hearst and Pulitzer's lead, newspapers around the nation begin to understand that having a good comic and a good funny pages, well, that could boost your circulation a lot. And Hearst in particular wanted to make sure that he was always on top of what was popular and what was well known. So he began to do what we call syndicate. So what is syndication? A strip that was really popular in New York could probably be really popular in California too. And instead of having each paper just have its local comic artists, he began to syndicate his strips across all of his papers so that whether you were in Minnesota, Chicago, New York, or Florida, you could run a popular newspaper strip. He begins doing this in 1902, and by 1914, founds King's Features Syndicate, which is still working to this day. Newspapers all across the nation begin trying to find the next big hit. The first daily strip appears in the San Francisco Examiner in 1907. It's called Amut. It was actually in the sports page, where a lot of comics were at the time. Amut was a gambler. He would bet on the horse races, and there would be jokes around which horse was best, but it would also tell you who had won the previous races. So it was simultaneously a joke strip and a strip about horse racing. In 1908, Hearst acquired the paper and renamed it Mutt and Jeff. And we have the sort of duo here, Laurel and Hardy, tall, skinny guy, short, fat guy. And this is a huge hit across the nation. Other strips that come up at this time that are very popular, Bringing Up Father by George McManus, Frederick Opper's Happy Hooligan, for example. These strips that become most popular not only are popular as newspaper strips, but they are featured in radio shows and in movie serials and in black and white film shorts. They make both their producers and the newspapers a lot of money. I've included as well Gasoline Alley, which starts around this time and is still running to this day. Uh, it's one of the first newspaper strips to show characters aging in real time. Now, it's not the same author or artist. They've switched a couple times over the course of the strip, but the strip itself and its storyline, still going. Now, comics could make millionaires, but comic strips could be artistic, too. Some of the stars of this movement were Windsor McKay, whose Little Nemo in Slumberland is well known to this day as a masterpiece of illustration, Lionel Fenninger, whose Winky's World and Kinder Kids ran in a Chicago newspaper, well, 
he was actually better known as a Bauhaus artist. I'll show you in a second. And finally, who we'll be looking at in more detail here shortly, George Harriman's Crazy Cat, which runs from 1913 to 1944. Now here are some examples from Windsor McKay's Little Nemo in Slumberland. It's really beautiful. These were usually full color Sunday page strips that would take up the whole Sunday page. So they would also be very, very large. Little Nemo and Slumberland centered around Nemo falling asleep in the beginning of the panel and falling out of bed and waking up in the last panel. But the way in which Windsor McKay was able to use the fantastic elements of dreams and the sort of layout of the page to emphasize those fantastic and surreal elements was well ahead of its years. And few people have been able to master it quite the extent that he has. For example, in this page, the growing and shrinking of the panels mimics the way the, the acrobat's movement and swinging across the page might feel. We swing along the panels as the acrobat swings through the air. In this page, these tall, long panels, as the elephant closes in on us, create a sense of tension and impending danger as we watch alongside Nemo as the elephant slowly but surely comes at us. Or this beautiful page in which the details of space are spread across the whole page. That even though we are technically following one character through these panels, at the same time, the use of blacks and colors give us a space vista across the whole page. Now here's Lionel Fenninger. As I mentioned, he did Kinder Kids and Wee Willy Winkie's World. He had a very unique style of illustration that would look much different than what you might expect. His page layouts were also very interesting. As I mentioned, Fenninger would go on to be known better as a Bauhaus artist a printmaker and a fine artist in the modernist tradition. And a problem happens if you love comics and want to keep reading them. Well, you have to keep a lot of newspapers or make your own scrapbook. So in 1933, a guy by the name of Maxwell Gaines began publishing famous funnies of Carnival of Comics and distributed it through Woolworth's department store. This was mostly just collecting famous comic strips with some games and puzzles putting it into a book. But this is the first comic book, and it sets the stage for the golden age in the future. In our next two videos, we're going to examine some important and influential newspaper comics. First up, A Crazy Cat. See you next time.